Hello, everyone, and welcome to Believe in Bills, and I am Sal Majorana. Today, I have a, a guest because Adam Benini is off riding his bike to Toronto, I think. Um, hard to believe, but that's what he's doing. So I've brought in my uh, good buddy, Matt Perino, who covers the Bills for New York Upstate and Syracuse.com. Matt, welcome to uh, Believe in Bills. Oh, man, I am honored and excited to chop it up with you my friend usually we're As just you should. making fun of each other on, on press row but it'll be good to do it in podcast form yes uh, many of you already know matt because he and ryan talbot do a great job on their po on their podcast and youtube show uh shout so um we're trying to just be like matt and ryan uh here at believe in bills with me and adam we're just getting started so let's get right to it matt because we don't like to mess around adam and i we get right to the football um, so let's look, we've had, we've had months to digest what the bills are going to do going into the 24 season. And I wanted to start with you today on roster construction, because that part of this equation just wrapped up this week. So if you could just give me, give me a few of your broad thoughts on how things shook out with building this 53 man roster. You know, I think first and foremost, this team is valuing special teams still. Um, as much as they ever have. And we we always talk about this as we're putting together these 53-man roster projections. You know, Sean McDermott, Brandon Bean, like being ahead of the get curve in special teams, giving themselves an advantage, trying to give themselves an advantage, is always at play. And that's what we saw when they traded for Brandon Codrington. It's why they kept Casey Tuhill as the 10th ten defensive lineman. Uh, we spent all summer talking about Tyrell Shavers in, in, in Rochester. And I think if we would have spent a little bit more time on the fact that this team has kept five wide receivers the last two years, Tyrell Shavers might have been on the outside looking in on a lot more 53-man roster projections. And then my other big broad thought is like, all right, maybe the Bills are falling back a little bit around the league in terms of, you know, their drafting, their roster construction. None of their players were claimed. So I think Brandon Bean kind of knew um, or, or was hoping and it played out that uh, some of these guys, they're they going to be able to get back on their practice squad. I think they've they built a pretty competitive practice squad. They brought in a couple receivers that I think uh, you can get excited about in the pipeline, if you will. Uh, they have uh, a third quarterback now in Mike White, who I think some would argue is a little bit more exciting than even the, the backup that they have in Mitchell Trubisky. I think, I think one of the things we often forget about is teams love their own players, right, Matt? I mean, they bring 90 to camp. They wish they could keep all 90 of them. So, you know, everyone gets all excited about cut down day and this guy's available, that guy's available. The Bills should go get that guy. And very rarely does that happen. I think I saw somewhere, I don't know the exact number, somebody put it out the other day that after the cut down, after the cuts were made, what was it, like 17 players that were on the waiver wire were claimed by, by different teams. I think it was some mm -hmm. ridiculously low number out of, over a thousand guys got cut on, right. between Monday and Tuesday. Seventeen got picked up. So I think we really do go overboard when we, when we start thinking about all that stuff. And then the practice squad, yeah, I mean they got back probably every guy they wanted to get back on the practice squad. Was there one that they didn't get back, Matt? That you look at like, oh yeah, I wish they could have gotten that. There wasn't, right? No. And, and the one guy that you know you thought might be in the mix was Justin Shorter. He's doing a position change, going to tight end to, to uh, get on with the Las Vegas Raiders. And I think like under the radar here over the last couple of days as the dust has settled, Lewis seen uh, the, the first round safety from Minnesota a couple of years ago. That's a really nice developmental piece. You can get him in your building for a couple of weeks, teach him your system, see if that might be an option because what is the one of the biggest topics we've talked about all summer long? Are the Bills calling Micah Hyde? As each injury piles up, are the Bills going to get on the phone with 23? I still maintain that that's a down the road, very short term possibility. We were there, Sal. Like every week, it was something with his neck last year. I don't think he has a long window if he does decide to come back and give it one more run. I think that's a you're desperate in December or maybe even January. You call him up, get him back into the mix. A guy like Seen, who played over 150 snaps in the preseason, and and maybe the Minnesota Vikings didn't like what they saw. Maybe a, a, a scenery change, getting into a system with Sean McDermott. We know what he does with defensive backs. That's a really interesting addition. Yeah, that guy was a first-round pick in 2022. He blew out his leg. I think he broke his leg. Uh, serious mm -hmm. compound pr fracture. I think it was like week five of his rookie season. So he really has. And then they changed defensive coordinators. Uh, last year, Brian Flores went to Minnesota, and they sort of changed um, how they play defense. And I guess scene just didn't fit in. 
But that kid was a pretty good player on a, on a championship team at Georgia. He was James, Cook, James Cook's uh, teammate. So you're right. That's an interesting sign. Um, you know, and also down the road, too, man. I mean, DeMar Hamlin's going to be in his last year of his contract. They're probably not bringing him back. Mike Edwards, I think, is a one-year deal. Um, so you've got Taylor Rapp and Cole Bishop, you would think, are your guys next year. Lewis Seen's a perfect guy to bring in if it works out as your as your third DB. So I like that move, too. All right, so we, we might as well jump to this, the, the point that everyone wants to know. Is this roster that they built capable of winning a fifth straight a AFC East title? You mentioned it, that none of their players got picked up. So you wonder about the viability of the entire roster. What do you think? Are they good enough to win the division? I'm going to say yes, just on the basis of having the best quarterback in the division, because let's it's a quarterback-driven league. And I think that when you get to December – the Miami Dolphins have to build themselves up enough of a lead that they won't like, you know, for lack of a better term, piss it away in December, right? Like they did a year ago. Tua yeah. is a really fun young quarterback. When he's operating on schedule, he's really good. They got a bunch of fast weapons out there. But that defense without Christian Wilkins, that's a bigger question mark than anything I think the Bills are facing on defense because Sean McDermott always finds a way to get this unit especially on the back end to being a top 10 unit in the NFL. So I'm a little bit more concerned about Miami. They got two edge rushers coming off serious season ending injuries a year ago. And then that secondary is getting older. The jets are to me, the wild card because that defense is super bowl caliber, right? But that offense, while it has some weapons, I don't know if Aaron Rodgers at his age and playing barely any football over the last year and a half is ready to come back and lead the charge. There's talent around him at the skill spots, but the blockers up front, there's still a ton of question marks about that offensive line. I think the Bills' strength is their offensive line. Josh Allen, he has a young first-round draft pick tight end that they're trying to build this thing around, and I still think the defense is going to be pretty good. So I still think they're going to win the AFC East. Is it going to be closer than ever before? Definitely. I think this could come down to the final week. Yeah, just like last year. I mean, the Bills literally stole the division from the Dolphins. <laughs> Deontay Hardy re returns that punt, and all of a sudden they're division champs. So, I, yeah, I think they're absolutely going to go right to the wire. Unlike you, I'm more concerned about the Jets. I think we had this discussion on radio yesterday here in Rochester, um, Catalana and I with uh, DiTulio, um, and, and they we asked basically the same question. Is this team good enough to win it? And I think if you look at the Jets roster, top to bottom, 1-53, to I think they're slightly better than the Bills, and that's contingent on Aaron Rodgers being at least semi-Aaron Rodgers, right? We don't know. The guy, like you said, he hasn't played for a year and a half. I think, as annoying as he is, <laughs> I think he's got one more run in him to be to be problematic. And I think the Jets have built a pretty good team around him. They've upgraded that skill. I mean, Brees Hall is terrific, and we all know about um, Garrett Wilson. Um, they've added somebody who's I'm, I'm brain farting Mike on Williams. right now. Mike Williams. Mike Williams. They've got some players. Their offensive line is a little bit better. I'm more concerned about them than Miami, but Miami, with all that speed and Buffalo's secondary being in a little bit of a transition period, that's going to be interesting to watch too. So, yeah, I think the Bills can win it. I think they're a 10 or 11 win team, but it's going to be it's going to be a very, very tight division and you can't rule out the fact that New England might steal a game here or there from, from somebody that's going to be competing for the top of the division. All right, so we brought up, um, we brought up Mike Wright. Before I get to Mike White, though, I got to get your thoughts on this whole uh, the, the the ESPN poll and how I think it was eleven out of the hundred and three guys that they mm. polled <laughs> thought Josh Allen was overrated. I don't know, Matt. I mean, that that seems a little bit uh, I don't know. S stupid would be the word. How can anybody think that Josh Allen is overrated? And I think this goes back to it goes back to two things. He hasn't won a Super Bowl, which guess what? A lot of guys haven't won a Super Bowl in this league because Patrick Mahomes has won three of them now in the last, whatever, it's five or six years. That's part of it. And the turnovers. I think he gets knocked down the peg more than anybody because of the turnovers. Yet, I did this last year. I did a story on it. You go back and look at the turnovers last year. There were like, I think he had 18 total. There were like four that even had a semi-impact on, mm -hmm. on the final result of the game. Yeah, they, it all sucks when you turn it over. But his turnovers were very often not even an important part, excuse me, important part of the game. 
And I think that's why everyone thinks he's overrated. I think it's crazy. What are your thoughts? Yeah. So like I get that he makes a lot of mistakes, but for every mistake he makes, there's five to 10 game changing plays that he makes and that he puts his team in a position to win week in and week out. And, you know, I think that first of all, when you're talking about players, like they have their own kind of vibes with it all right like I, th I think I saw in that poll that Lamar Jackson was voted as the second best quarterback in the NFL and like I like Lamar Jackson a lot he's fun to watch he's a really good player but when the games start to matter in January Lamar Jackson has been irrelevant and that to me is the the biggest measuring stick for quarterbacks is like what do you do when you have a chance to go to a Super Bowl and the Bills haven't gone to a Super Bowl yet but the only team in the AFC that's gone to a Super Bowl in this era has been the Chiefs. And one year when Joe Burrow got through with the Cincinnati Bengals. And I think you can make an argument that Josh Allen has been as good against the Chiefs on the offensive side as any other player in football over the last couple of years. It's just they got Patrick Mahomes on the other side. And it's going to be this, you know, it was the it was the story with Peyton Manning and Tom Brady for years. Right, Sal? Like Peyton Manning was knocking on the door, knocking on the door, knocking on the door. People were calling him overrated. It was just, it was just that you had that guy on the other side, and then eventually Peyton Manning won a Super Bowl. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Lamar Jackson is a terrific player. I did not think he was the MVP of the league last year. Um, the, the first time he won it, yeah, I, I think he was the true MVP. But like you said, he's done nothing in the postseason. And if you're asking me today, on whatever date this is, August 30th, who would you want to start an NFL franchise with, Patrick Mahomes? Josh Allen or Lamar Jackson, I would skew right now Patrick Mahomes, but there's no doubt about it. Josh Allen would be the next guy that I would take if he gets, if Mahomes went somewhere else, Josh Allen over Lamar Jackson every single time for me. There's so many things that Josh Allen can do that, you know, no other really player can do. I mean, Patrick Mahomes, I guess, is in his own category and he does rush the ball a little bit. But the way that Josh Allen can take over the game as a runner and what he can do down the field, all three areas, I think the argument's been made about Lamar that he's never had like star power around him, although he's had a pretty good tight end. They've had some good receivers there uh, over the years. They had Odell Beckham a couple years ago. We'll find out a lot about Josh Allen this year. Like if you want to take that overrated, um, you know, declaration and, and throw it off to the side. If you're Josh Allen, you go out this year with Stefan Diggs now playing in Houston. And if you put up those numbers once again, I don't think any party in the media in the league is going to be able to call this guy overrated. Yeah, no way. All right. Since we're on quarterback, I thought I'd bring up the Mike White um, signing the other day. You know, my, man, I told I, you and I have talked probably 10 times on the sidelines about Mitch Trubisky and why the hell the Bills brought him back. I don't understand it. They had him here once. Yeah, he was a good dude. Allen liked him, all that. And then he went off to try again to be a starter in Pittsburgh and flopped, you know, spectacularly. Couldn't even hold the job against Kenny Pickett, for crying out loud. And the Bills, for whatever reason, bring him back, again, because he's a good guy and Josh likes him. But God forbid Josh Allen got hurt. And he does have 98 straight starts, so we haven't had to worry about this since 2018. But if he should get hurt, you want a guy who can go in and, and be competitive and win. I, I just don't see Trubisky being the guy. They signed Mike White, though, the other day. Now, look, Mike White is, is not a starting quarterback in the NFL. But if you had to, if you asked me who would be the guy I would trust more to go into a game right now, I would pick Mike White over Mitch Trubisky. I don't know what you think. I'd like to know. But if, if Trubisky is going to be out the first couple of weeks, I'm actually kind of comfortable with Mike White as the backup quarterback. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? So first and foremost, the worst thing that ever happened to the Bills and Mitch Trubisky is that in his first stint, he really didn't play any meaningful snaps in the regular season, right? Yeah. Like he played in the preseason, got in the year, and Josh Allen, you know, and the Bills are happy about this, was healthy. So you never got to see what it was going to actually look like. That was when Brian Dable was still here. So we're two offensive coordinators away from that. And to your point, he looks so bad in Pittsburgh that it almost makes you wonder, like, Okay, he's a backup quarterback. He, you thought he was going to be an upgrade over Kyle Allen. And I thought for the most part in practices, he looked pretty solid. But you're right. Once we got to the games, it just it was such a difficult proposition of working them down the field. And that's because he always is 
always is going to take the check down. Always. That's just ingrained in who he is. Mike White, the complete opposite. He's going to be a guy that goes out there and to his detriment at times, tries to push the ball down the field, tries to make big plays. Brandon Bean even mentioned it when we talked to him a couple of days ago, remembering that game when he got drilled by Matt Milano and still stayed in the game. Um, he's a gamer, right? And I think you need that as the backup to Josh because Josh in his own way is that kind of you know risk-taking gamer himself. So I like the addition. I think it's going to be another situation where if you get to the opener and Mitch isn't ready, you got a quarterback that you got to send out there potentially as a backup that has only been in the, in the building for two weeks. But I think his style is better suited for what they want to do. Uh, so we'll see. It's definitely a good addition. And I wouldn't be surprised if – at some point, like the money makes sense to keep him on the roster this year in Trubisky, but if they go in a different direction next year. Yeah, I mean, and you're right. Bean said it the other day. This guy is no check down Charlie, which is exactly how Mitch Trubisky plays, which drives you nuts. So, yeah, hopefully we don't have to worry, even worry about this. Josh Allen just stays healthy all year, which has been his, you know, it's been his motto's modus operandi since 2018. But, yeah, I like the addition. Um, sticking with the offense, Matt, I wanted to bring up, um, I just did a big story on Ray Davis today. Um, finally did some real journalism, Matt, you know, wrote a good 3000 word story instead of, you know, five reasons why the bills are going to stink this year, whatever stupid stuff I have to usually write. But this one, I kind of dug into a little bit and you know, the story because, you know, you know, from the draft and all that. Anyways, Ray Davis, I think is going to play a role on this team. Um, James Cook had 281 touches last year. Way more. I mean, that was more than he had his entire college career. Mm -hmm. He's a good player. I think some of that was, it was quiet, I thought, Matt. I mean, he compiled stats last year, but there were certainly moments when James Cook, you know, didn't do the things you needed him to do. Again, good player, but I think adding Ray Davis to the mix, I really like it. And I think, I think Ray Davis is going to take some snaps away from James Cook. I'm not really thinking too much about Ty Johnson for this. I think he's a good guy to have on the team, but I don't know what you think. I think Ray Davis might be the number two and he might be the guy who plays when James Cook needs a breather or things aren't going well. They've set themselves up and they've stocked the cupboard. Like, you know, you don't want to pay a running back in this economy when you are paying your uh, quarterback and James Cook is going to be coming up in two years. These, these four years on these rookie running back uh, contracts go quick and I think that Ray Davis, to your point, is the perfect kind of compliment for now. And we'll see if he can maybe ascend into a larger role if James Cook prices himself out of Buffalo. Here's the thing, though. There's so much that goes into this offense. I still think that you're going to see generally what James Cook had last season again this year. Can he stay healthy, though? He stayed healthy last year, and that kept him on the field. That's what I'm going to be watching for a little bit more this year. And if Davis kind of shows that he's comfortable in the first month of the season, they put a little bit on his plate, he aces the test, and you're willing to put a little bit more on his plate as you go, then you're starting to see, okay, if James Cook has any of those drop issues that you saw last year, they need him to be a big part of this passing game. There, yeah. There's just a lack of big-time reliable weapons in the wide receiver room. They're excited about Shakir, Curtis Samuel. We could talk about all five of those guys and what they potentially can be. But I still think you trust James Cook just about as much as any of them in the passing game. And he had some drop issues last year. So if he has any of those issues, Ray Davis is a guy that they trust in the passing game as well. Did it at a high level in college. I'm right there with you. I think that he's his role is only going to gradually grow over the course of his rookie season. And I think he could be in line to be the uh, heir apparent to Cook if he signs a big contract at the end of his deal. I think, I think we're going to see more passes to running backs this year. I mean, they kind of have to, right? With with all those targets gone with Diggs and Davis, I think I think Joe Brady is going to rework some things. I think they're going to see more two tight end than we probably think we're going to see um, with Kincaid and Knox. And I think the running backs are going to have to play a role in that passing game. And, you know, those are the easy button throws for Josh Yellen. I don't think he's, he's thrilled about making those throws. He'd rather go to his outside guys down the field a bit. But I think they're going to be important. And, yeah, you're right, James Cook, if he can prove that he can stop dropping the ball and make plays, he will keep Ray Davis, you know, not glued to the bench, but certainly maybe taking less touches than I'm anticipating he'll get. But he's got to go out and do it, so we'll see. All right, let's go over to defense real quick. Yesterday, um, I guess the news got out that uh, McDermott is going to let Bobby Babich call the plays. 
mighty nice of him, I guess, right? The way it should have gone all along. Look, Sean did a good job last year, but I've always been, you know, I go back to the Marv Levy days, Matt, because I'm old. And one of the things that Marv did best, and he even said it, you got to delegate. The head coach has got to be the CEO, and you delegate to your coaches, especially your coordinator. So you know, I wasn't thrilled last year when Sean was doing both jobs. He did admit at the end of the season that he lost track of the offense and special teams sometimes because he was you know, huddling with the defense. So I think it's good that he's got a trusted lieutenant in Bobby Babbage. He's been there since day one. Nobody knows the defense better than Babbage does. I'm glad that Sean's going to entrust him to just do the job. And I like the energy, we both do, that Babbage brings to it. So I'm looking forward to seeing how he calls the defense. Yeah, I think Sean's still going to have his thumbprint on some of the things they do and the big decisions that have to be made. But I like the fact that he's going to turn it over to Bobby and let him run with it. What do you think? Definitely. And if you look at some of the coaches that do call their own, like, side of the ball like Andy Reid's the, the the cleanest example of somebody that does it at a high level he's got somebody on the other side of the ball that he could trust to be almost like a head coach in his own right and Steve Spagnola uh the Bills don't have that right like they have two very young coordinators that I think Sean has to kind of be ingrained on both sides of the ball be involved in both sides of the ball and you can't do that if you're all of your attention every week is game planning setting all of you know uh the plans for a game and then getting into the game and then focusing so much on the defense and i think yeah babich if you're going to have anybody call your defense i don't know if you could find a better guy to do it who's been there since 2017 has been in multiple position rooms and to your point has a group of guys that seem to really want to play for him um i think joe brady like as much as this is going to be the storyline every year with in josh allen's prime it's going to be they get off to a slow start i mean that's going to be trouble because you we talked about at the start of the show if the bills drop too far down in the afc east it's going to be really daunting to try to make up that ground against two teams that are kind of nipping at their heels a little bit so i think having a little bit of involvement but the other question that i kind of ping pong back to you is more involvement on the offensive side at the same time a good thing because at times it seemed like fans and media have been frustrated when sean wants his thumbprint too much on the philosophy offensively yeah i think i think he trusts joe brady to operate that side i mean obviously the, the head coach has got to make the big decisions go for it on fourth down or you know he can overrule a play that he hears in the headset at the last second. I don't think, I think Sean, I don't know. We're, we're not on the field, so we're not really sure what the hell's going on down there, but I think Sean does step aside for the most part on offense. He had, he trusted Dable until they didn't get along, I guess. And, you know, he trusted Ken Dorsey until he fired him and now he's got Brady. So I think, I think he has let these guys do what they need to do. And I think he'll stay out of the mix that way. He'll make the big decisions, which is what I think is the most important thing for the head coach to do. So I think Brady, I think the pressure, if you ask me who's under more pressure this year, Joe Brady or Bobby Babbage in his first year calling plays, I think it's Brady. Wouldn't you say so? With the weapons that he has, the quarterback he has, they've scored over 30 points per game for like four straight years. They've got to keep that train rolling and buy, and uh, Joe Brady's on the hook for that. He did a great job taking over at midseason, but he's changing some things, right? Like even Josh Allen said that like conceptually they're adding new things to this offense. It's going to look different. This is the first real departure from the Brian Dable offense that really took this offense to the moon. So you're right. If it doesn't look right, like what are they going to be? We've seen so much over the last couple of weeks, like in, in camp and then in the preseason, I don't think they're showing much. Are they going to be a more heavily 12 personnel usage team? Are they going to continue to be an 11? Are they going to use some more three tight end looks? Um, you know, I know they love Reggie Gilliam. I think a lot, a lot of us are kind of cringe every time he's on the <laughs> receiving end of a pass from Josh Allen, but I totally agree with you. I think that the the pressure is always going to be on the offensive coordinator because it's like, if you're not getting the most out of Josh Allen, what are we doing here? Yep. All right, Matt, I think we can wrap it up, pal. Um, look, I appreciate you jumping in here for me. Um, we like cross promotion here at Believe in Bills. So go ahead and uh, go ahead and pimp your, your deal, even though you don't need to, because they got like 5 million subscribers over there at Shout. But uh, tell people where they can find you too. 
Listen, I don't I don't have any interest in, in pimping that, but I will tell you that you better <laughs> sign up for Pinstripe Pride, baby. Uh, <laughs> no, Pinstripe People. Pinstripe People. I get my newsletter every week on, on the Yankees, every three days after the series, and usually sales complaining about something. Yeah, I will uh, I will continue to pimp that everywhere. But, uh, hey, I appreciate that. And, Matt, I'll see you out there uh, next week. Thanks for being here. And for everyone out there, this has been Believe in Bills. Have a great day.